Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Jericho, Jericho walls are breaking, strongholds now shaking. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. Jericho walls are breaking, strongholds now shaking. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. bless you. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we will see you on Sunday.
Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the All right, good morning. I hope that got you guys ready to get up and stand and worship our great God together. Word of life, speak to my weary heart. Strengthen my broken parts, lead me to your open arms. Word of truth, illuminate all these lies. Enemy speaks inside, and freedom I will rise. You call me out from the grave, so I can live my life in change. There is a new song in my soul, and it begins every day. Word of life.
Aren't you glad we are a chosen and called people? And we can stand in his love. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a pain. There's resurrection power. You may be seated. Welcome. Welcome, folks online, and uh, welcome you here to this beautiful building. It's good to have you with us today. Uh, I know we have guests. I've been meeting them all morning long, and uh, that's been great opportunity to get to know folks, and we welcome you. I'm Pastor Stan, one of the pastors here at Emmanuel, and it's my job just to say, this is the place where God wants you to be right now, okay? I can't, I can't answer after this. But I can tell you, you're here, and this is by directed by God, and we're delighted that you are here. When you came in, we, you were handed a packet of material, 
And within that packet is this card. Uh, This is an important part of why God brought you here today is for you to fill out this card. Did you know that? I'm just letting you know. Make sure you understand that. We give you a pen, and so you can fill this out. I just want to go over it very quickly with you. Uh, Please put your name and your email and your snail mail, all of that on there. That's very important. Over on the right-hand side at the top says first-time guests, second-time guests. Check the appropriate box for that, and uh, we will be sending you just a little surprise in the mail, so uh, please do that. And then come down about halfway down. is a place called Next Steps, and here at Emmanuel, this is an important part of our worship time, and um, Pastor Justin's preaching this morning, and he's going to be talking about isolation to fellowship and the importance of getting to know one another, and you'll want to know these next steps because he'll come back to these, so I'm letting you know ahead of time. You'll know where they are. Underneath that is the prayer and praise request. Uh, We say this every week, but we mean it, uh, that we are concerned and we are willing to pray for you and with you, whatever it is that God would have on your heart. You can feel free to write whatever that is. These are done in confidence, and uh, we pastors pray about these, and we we respond appropriately, and we hope that you'll feel free to share with us what we can pray for you with. If you turn the card over, it's called the Serve Side, and we have some really cool things going on uh, that we uh, need assistance with, opportunity for you to fellowship with other folks. Our fall festival will be Halloween night. That is a Sunday night. And so we need folks to help out with that. We need some people to bring their cars decorated up. We need candy. All that good kind of thing happens. Uh, Last year, in the midst of everything going on, we had over 200 students here, 200 children. We are expecting more than that this year. So help us out. Bring in your stuff. Uh, You can put it in the uh, welcome Center, there's a table back there. So all of that, our Haiti shoe boxes are back there also. You can help a child in Haiti by taking a box and filling it up. So it's just good to have you with us today. Good to have our folks online. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, this good day, opportunity to be here in your house and to be tuned in um, through, the, through the online service. Thank you, Father, for uh, the privilege of being here together. I pray for Pastor Rick and his family and that you keep them safe and return them to us today. And we look forward to seeing him tomorrow here on campus. Lord, you are good to us. Your name is everything. It's powerful. It's wonderful. Um, And we look forward to the truth that you are with us no matter where we are. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name. Some of you will remember the song, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior go, girl. forever. Go, girl. Well, that song was written over 80 years ago. And you know what? It is still as relevant today as ever. God's people were singing about victory long before now, long before that song was ever written. But we need to know that we need to declare and praise God and ask him to give us that victory. Do we still need victory today? Yes, we do. So let's declare it together. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. 
every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. Oh, I know how this story ends. You know how it ends? You know how it ends? Come on. I know how this story ends. Let's sing it out. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Death could not hold you. They'll torn before you. you silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the King. team. Thank you, Janet, for reminding us of the victory that we have in Jesus. Amen. Well, it is so good to be back with you, uh, Emmanuel Church. Two weeks ago, obviously, we couldn't meet in person. And then last week, uh, I was in exile um, because I tested positive for, uh, for the COVID. And, and uh, so I had to stay at home. And, and so um, I kind of let myself go a little bit uh, if you can tell, I have this big old beard uh, that I have been growing, and, and I call it my Corin beard uh, because I've grown it during a little quarantine. My wife calls it the thing you need to shave off, um, but, uh, but I'm also using it as a publicity stunt uh, to get middle and high schoolers to come to winter retreat January 14th through 16th uh, because I promised them if we get 30 middle and high schoolers uh, to come on retreat January 14th through 16th, I am going to let them decide what I do with the beard. I know, I've given them too much power, right? I'm, I'm letting them decide whether to, to keep it, to shave it, to shave half of it, to, um, you know, make a mustache that uh, I haven't had since high school, to dye it some weird color, uh, right? And, and so <clears throat> I have this um, publicity stunt going on, that, uh, and I hope all of your middle and high schoolers are going to come to retreat. Um, but I also looked at myself in the mirror this morning and I said, you know what, this could be 
a sermon illustration, right? Any good pastor worth his salt is going to look at anything and say, that could be an illustration uh, for my message today, right? And, and so when I looked at this uh, beard in the morning, I was reminded of a movie that I've only seen in pieces. Have you ever seen a movie, but only in pieces, right? Maybe it's too long, uh, like the Lord of the Rings, and, and you said to yourself, I'm not going to sit here for three hours. I'll chunk this out in an hour-long mo- uh uh, over the course of a few nights, or, or maybe you went to the theater and you got the large soda, right, and, and you started drinking it and, and nature took its course and, and you started to think, well, uh, I need to go, but they wouldn't pause the movie for you. They, you you talked to the projectionist and they said, uh, I'm sorry, you're not the only one here. Uh, we need to uh, be considerate of other people. And you said, well, be considerate of me. Um, but So you missed part of the movie, right? You only saw part a piece of the movie, maybe you had to come back to it. Or maybe you were like me, and you grew up in the time where movies would play on TV, and you'd flip to them, but you couldn't rewind, right? Today, you might be able to rewind to the beginning, or or you can go on demand and say, oh, I I like that movie, I want to watch it for myself. But but it used to be, and and sometimes still is, that movies will just play on TV, and if you flip to them, uh, you can't go back to the beginning. Uh, You can only watch it right where it is, right? And, And so... Uh, that's the way that I saw Castaway for the first time. Have anybody seen Castaway in here? It's the story of this guy played by Tom Hanks, who, who's a normal guy. Uh, he works at FedEx, and, and he does his, his thing, but, but he's not this amazing survivalist, but he gets thrust into a situation where he is all by himself. He, his ship, uh, his, his, uh, his plane goes down, and he's on this deserted island with nothing but his wits, and a volleyball that he starts talking to named Wilson, right? And, and so he's on this island, and he's cast away. And, and I would always flip to the movie at the most depressing part, where he is down in the dumps, and, and he is just trying so hard to survive. And he's gone a little bit crazy because he started talking to this volleyball, and, and, and he is trying his best to get back to society. But he's grown this long beard, and he's a wild man out there, alone and isolated on this island, right? And so he's trying to look for uh, a way to live. And then I would flip back to college football. I never, never saw the end of the movie. I, I hope he made it out alive. Who knows? Um, but I only saw this part where he was away from society. But the thing is, the theme of the movie is that, that he needs to get back, that, that this is no way to live, that, that being on a deserted island with only a volleyball to talk to is not the way that we were meant to be, that, that we need people in our lives. We need each other. That's the theme of many other films like that. If you've seen The Martian, that's a more recent example of, of Matt Damon got stranded on Mars and, and he did everything he could to get back in communication with people. We need hope, right? But the thing is, I feel like over this past year and a half, Some of us have been forced into isolation. Maybe our plane didn't crash in the middle of the ocean, but we've had to be isolated from each other, and it wasn't really our choice, at least not at first. And so some of us are are fighting with everything we have to get back to one another, while others maybe are retreating further back. And, And maybe they feel like they don't need to come back. And maybe they're content with their Wilsons, their volleyballs, and and we might call them a smartphone or a TV screen or or a good book and, and me, myself, and I, right? But I'm here to remind us today that God's plan is not for us to be alone, to be by ourselves, just wasting away. No, God's plan for us is to be together, that fellowship is so much better and fuller and more than isolation. And, and if you remember, I've already admitted uh, that I'm an introvert uh, a while ago, <clears throat> but you might remember that, you might not. Um, and so this is coming from an admitted introvert uh, who says, actually, no, we need each other. We don't need to just sit back. And so why do I say that fellowship is better than isolation? Well, I want us first to look at the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, uh, mostly written by King Solomon, 
are what I call nuggets of wisdom from the mind of God. Pastor Rick likes to call them bumper sticker theology. Uh, basically, there's these little nuggets of truth that could fit on a bumper sticker that could uh, go with you, but, but God gave them to Solomon. Solomon was the, one of the kings of Israel, and, and God said, ask anything you want from me. And Solomon said, I want wisdom. And God gave it to him in spades. And, and so the first part of the book of Proverbs is Solomon talking to his son, saying, these are the things that you need to know. Wisdom is important. Knowledge and understanding from God is important. And then it goes into these little sayings that are easy to memorize and easy to put in our hearts and our minds. So they're not necessarily promises or or prophecies, but they're general truths that show us uh, the way that God created things to be. Proverbs 18, verse 1. God gives Solomon the divine wisdom to write this. One who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound wisdom. Isolation. Isolation is, is selfish and foolish, Solomon says. He says it's selfish because you couldn't care less about all those other people, what, what they're up to, what, what they're doing, whether they need you or not. All you need is, is you, yourself, and you, right? And, and the rest of the world can go take a hike. And, and it's foolish because you begin to lose your perspective. You begin to fold in on yourself and, and you forget what God has, has put in your life, these wise people who could speak into your life. And, and so I want us to ask the question this morning, why is isolation so bad for us? Why is isolation so bad for us? And, and I want to suggest four reasons that isolation is so bad for us that come from four different stories uh, from the Bible, from the Old Testament specifically. And then I want us to move from that isolation to talk about fellowship, to talk about what God's good plan is to get us back into a right relationship with him and a right relationship with each other. So first, let's look at why is isolation so bad for us? Well, first of all, it breeds loneliness and depression. Isolation breeds loneliness and depression. But you say, Pastor Justin, uh, what about the Lone Ranger? Uh, he wasn't lonely and depressed. He, he was out there fighting for justice, and he had Tonto, sure, but, but he was the Lone Ranger, and, and he could do it all by himself. And I'm the same way. I'm, I'm a Lone Ranger. I can do it all by myself. I don't need the rest of these people around me. Well, I want to suggest that we look at, at First Kings and, and look at the prophet Elijah. If anyone in the Bible would have been considered a lone ranger. It might have been Elijah, right? He, he was God's man. He was a prophet telling people uh, God's truth in a time in Israel's history where most people had turned away from that truth. When most people ha- had gone away, in fact, there were 450 prophets, people who were speaking for a false god of Baal. There were 450 of them and, and one of Elijah. And you would think, oh yeah, he's the Lone Ranger. He's going to get him. And, and he did. In fact, in, in 1 Kings 18, there's this famous story where, where Elijah stands up to those prophets and they do everything they can, these 450 people trying to get Baal, their, their false god, to do something. And Elijah says, well, maybe he's on a journey or, or maybe, you know, he took the bathroom break that you took in the movie theater. Uh, or maybe he, he's out there and, and he just doesn't hear you, right? And, and they all day, are they're cutting themselves, and they're yelling out, and they're saying, Baal, do something, and he does nothing. And Elijah says one prayer to the one true God, and he sends fire down from heaven. And it was this incredible victory, like we just sang about. God sent the victory to Elijah, and, and we're thinking, yes, Elijah, you did it. You are the best, and, and that's the pattern for me. I can be a lone ranger. I can fight against uh, this wicked, rotten culture, and, and everybody can be against me, but I'm going to be all right all by myself. But in the very next chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19, we see uh, Queen Jezebel and, and King Ahab are not very happy about this, uh, what went down with Elijah and the false prophets of Baal, and, and in fact, they put a hit out on him to take his life. 
In chapter 19, verses 3 through 4 and 9 through 10 say this, Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. And suddenly the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. Did you catch that? Elijah, after this amazing victory, after he had defeated the prophets of Baal and shown that God is the one true God, says, I feel alone. I feel like there's nothing here. and even I don't even want to live anymore if this is the way that it's going to be. If it's just me against the world, I don't think I can make it. I alone am left, and they're looking to take my life. And that can happen to us too easily. One minute we feel like we're doing great things for God, and and then the next minute we look around and we think, well, there's nobody else here with me. There's nobody else doing this with me. Or or we feel like we've built up all this momentum and and things are going so great, and then the next week we have to shut down and, and we can't see our friends and loved ones at church. Maybe we feel like that. Maybe you're feeling like you're alone. Maybe you feel like you're on this island that you can't get connected. I remember when all of this first started back in March of 2020, Becca and I were living in Nashville, and and all of uh, our parents, our family members, my brothers and sisters uh, lived in Maryland, and and all her relatives lived in, in New York, Um, At the time, my little brother Jason uh, lived in Louisville. I've been told to say Louisville, not Louisville, um, because if you're a local, you say Louisville. I only lived there for like a year, and then I lived in Nashville for a couple years, um, so I didn't get all the way into uh, the local vernacular. But, but anyways, Jason was was right there, and I felt like, oh yeah, we're connected. Um, And then he moved back to Maryland, and I was like, oh man, now I'm on this island again, and, and it's just me, and all of the rest of my family are back home in Maryland, and, and we're shut down, and what do we do? What do we do? And, and so um, eventually what I did was start sending out resumes to churches in Maryland, and, and I came here, um, and it was great. Um, and, and in the story of Elijah, um, God gave Elijah Elisha. Uh, this man who would come after him, who would be his protege. And God also said, there are 7,000 people in Israel who have not gone along with those false prophets. You're not alone, Elijah, even though you might feel that way. First of all, I'm going to give you someone to come alongside you and, and be there for you. And also, I'm going to remind you that there are so many others, even if they're not right with you, they're around the world and they care And they haven't gone along with them. They are continuing to worship the Lord God. And so for us in isolation, if we're starting to feel lonely, if we're starting to be depressed, remember that there's hope. Remember that there are others in the same boat. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But isolation breeds loneliness and depression. Isolation also makes us vulnerable to temptation. That's the next point on your outline. Isolation makes us vulnerable to temptation to temptation. When we're isolated, when we're away from accountability, when we're far from the positive influence of our church family, of our friends, we can fall into all sorts of traps and snares. Maybe you remember the story of David. Maybe you have heard of David, that he killed Goliath, that he was this man after God's own heart, that he was, if not the greatest king of Israel, one of the greatest kings of Israel. He was even called the precursor to King Jesus who would come later. The the prophets talked about one like David who would come and who would save Israel. Jesus was perfect, but David was not perfect, uh, if you remember the story. He had a great mistake, a big sin, a time when he missed the mark of God's perfection in in a really big way. It came in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You might have heard the story. He, He sees this woman... And he wants her, but he finds out that she's the wife of another 
man, but he takes her anyways. And then he has her husband killed. And it, it ruins so much of his life and so much of his family's life. But I want us to focus on the beginning of the story. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says this, In the spring, when kings marched out to war, David sent Joab and his officers and all Israel, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. And the story goes on to talk about what he did. But did you notice where David was at the beginning of this story? He was not where he was supposed to be. Uh, the kings had all gone out to war, but he stayed behind in Jerusalem. He was away from his officers. He was away from his high-ranking officials who, who could have held him accountable. And that's when he takes his evening stroll, and that's when he sees this temptation and his curiosity turns to lust, and that lust turns to adultery, and that adultery turns to murder, and that murder becomes something that comes back on him and his family. His son dies, and his other sons start to fight over the throne. All of this because he was isolated because he was away from the place where he was supposed to be, because he had no one speaking into his life telling him, don't do that, right? And, and I don't know about you, but I'm not at my best or my most presentable uh, when I am alone, right? When I'm just, it's just me. If it was just me, this beard would be very much longer. Uh, <laughs> when I graduated uh, from high school, uh, I had gone to a private school where uh, we had a very strict dress code and I had to shave all the time, and so I graduated from high school, and I said, I'm never going to shave again, and, uh, and it worked out for like a year or two, and, and then, you know, hygiene and all that set in, um, but, it, but if it was just up to me, um, I would kind of let myself go a little bit. In fact, when I was a bachelor, uh, when I was living at seminary, I only had one plate, uh, one fork, and one drinking glass, uh, and after every meal, I would uh, wash them. And sometimes, you know, it depended. If it was like something that didn't dirty it too much, you know, you could just put it back on, right? Uh, and and uh, I was kind of, you know, a little bit of a slob, a little bit slovenly, a little bit uh, something or other. Um, and then I got married uh, to my beautiful wife. And, uh, and she said, we can't live that way. Uh, <laughs> so we got more plates and, and silverware and glasses and, and all of that. And, and so the point of that story is, that sometimes when we're alone, we live like we want to live. We don't think about other things, right? Sometimes we can get spiritually slobby. A little bit, we can become spiritual slobs, right? And if we don't have people who speak into our lives who say, hey, maybe, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe you shouldn't be letting your thoughts go there. Maybe you shouldn't be letting yourself go to that website or, or go to that place, or be with those people. Uh, maybe we turn into spiritual slobs. And so <clears throat> sometimes we're sitting around like David was, and we end up thinking we can get away with something. But instead, we need people in our lives. We need that fellowship. We need to reject that isolation because it leaves us vulnerable to temptation. Thirdly, isolation keeps us from the truth. Isolation keeps us from the truth. And, and some of us have found that out the hard way over the past couple of years. More and more people are, are siloing themselves off and, and only getting their news and only putting their trust in what they see posted to social media. Uh, and, and anyone on social media can say anything about anything, uh, <clears throat> right? And so if we're not gathering together and if we're not speaking into each other's lives and, and having the truth, God's truth, uh, spoken into our lives, we can become isolated and, and keep ourselves from the truth. There's another king that you may not have heard of. He's not as, as famous as King David was, but his name is Rehoboam. He was actually Solomon's son. And, and in his day, 
the kingdom of Israel was hanging in the balance. And during his rule, uh, there were people in the other tribes who said, you know what, Solomon uh, really didn't treat us as well as we thought we should be treated. And, and we didn't get a fair shake under Solomon, and, and he put these heavy burdens on us. And, and so they came to Rehoboam and they said, you know, lighten our load a little bit. In 1 Kings 12, 5 through 8, this is what Rehoboam did. Rehoboam replied, go away for three days and then return to me. So the people left. And then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, how do you advise me to respond to this people? And the elders uh, go on to give him good advice. They say, you know, actually go easy on them. Do, do them good and they'll do good to you. But he rejected the advice of the elders who advised him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him and attended him. And, and they gave him terrible advice. They told him to double down and, and treat them even worse than Solomon had treated them. And he starts off so well. He starts off thinking, I'm going to go to the elders and, and I'm going to, to find uh, wisdom. But he didn't like that wisdom. It wasn't the truth that he wanted. It wasn't the wise counsel that, that he liked. And, and so he rejected that and said, you know what, I'm going to find a truth that I like. I'm going to find a truth that, that suits me, uh, that comes from people that, that I like and that I trust. And it had disastrous results. The, the kingdom was torn in two. Uh, Judah and the rest of the tribes of Israel were in constant conflict and turmoil. They, they never again reached the level of influence and, and power that they had under David and Solomon, where God had set them up to be a shining example to the rest of the nation, saying, this is God, and he is worth following. But instead, they were not a shining example. And do we do the same? Do we isolate ourselves from opinions, from truths that, that we don't like, and only surround ourselves with what we want to be true? So we're probably going to fall into the same trap that Rehoboam did. We're, we're going to have the same disastrous consequences. We'll, we'll start to lose our witness because people will look at us and say, well, they don't even believe any truth, so why should I listen to them about God's truth, about the Bible, right? We can't just plug our ears and, and say, I'm not listening for the rest of our lives. We need to come back together, not isolate ourselves from the truth, but listen to God's truth. So isolation keeps us from the truth. And finally, isolation tortures our souls. Isolation tortures our souls. From the very early chapters of the Bible, we can see this. Even Genesis uh, chapter 2, when God created the first man, Adam, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. So I'll make him a helper, suitable for him. That was Eve. And then Adam and Eve had a son named Cain, and, and they had another son named Abel, and, and Cain got jealous of Abel, and, and he killed him, the first murder recorded in the Bible. And God's punishment for Cain was to make him a restless wanderer, uh, that he wouldn't have a home, that he would have to uh, go and, and be away from society, away from civilization, and Cain's response was, my punishment is too great to bear. That was a punishment terrible, even worse than death. And, and even today we see that in, in our prison systems, they use isolation and what they call solitary confinement as a severe punishment. It's a, it's a, some say the worst punishment you could give someone. In fact, according to the Journal of the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law, isolation can be distressing as physical torture. It's like having your body physically tortured, right? And the question that I want to ask is, so why so often do we choose that for ourselves? Why so often do we choose to isolate ourselves, to torture ourselves, right? And I know for many of us over the past year and a half, that wasn't a choice, right? That, that was something that was thrust upon us without warning, Right? Even I, you know, admittedly had to miss uh, last week uh, because I got a positive COVID test, and so I had to isolate 
myself, and, and I got bored and grew this beard. Uh, but some of us <clears throat> have let those very real fears and those very real difficulties cause us to say, well, you know, I, I guess I should just stay away forever. I, I guess I can't come back. I, I, I don't know. There, there's, no, there's a chance that I might get hurt. There's a chance that something might happen to me. But I want to tell you that, that the greater danger is to continue to isolate ourselves. The greater danger is to continue to draw back. The greater danger is to torture ourselves instead of coming together for what God meant for your good and for his glory. Fellowship. I'm going to talk about that. And that's not to say that you shouldn't follow the advice of your doctor, that you shouldn't uh, stay at home if you feel sick. Don't come here and, and breathe on me and get me sick again. Um, but what I do want to tell you is that don't let those things accumulate and become an excuse to never be back with God's people. Right? There's a story in the Bible of a man named Lot, and, and he was Abraham's nephew, and they were living together, but their flocks and their, their servants and, and all the things that they owned got too big for both of them to live in the same place. And, and so Lot got to choose where he was going to go, and he chose this beautiful green valley, lush vegetation, but it turned out to be where Sodom and Gomorrah were. And if you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God said, there aren't even 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Out of the thousands of people who live there, there's not even 10 that follow me. And so Lot ended up going there, and he ended up actually barely escaping with his life when God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. But listen to this interesting thing that the Second Peter 2, 7 through 8 had to say. He said, If God rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the immoral, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. A lot apparently felt all alone there, right? Just like Elijah, he felt like he was the only one who even knew about God, and, and his soul was being tortured. But unlike Elijah, he, he didn't call out to God. He, he didn't seek out someone else. No, in, instead, he stayed there, and he let his soul get tortured day after day after day. Don't let that be you. Instead, let's look at the roadmap that God has given us to come back into fellowship with him and back into fellowship with his people. So how do we awaken from isolation to fellowship with God and one another? We just talked about all the bad things about isolation. Those are some pretty awful things that isolation does to us. But how do we get back to fellowship? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to return to God in repentance, faith, and commitment. Return to God in repentance, faith, and commitment. It's one of our theme verses for this series, but I'll repeat it again. You probably heard it last week and the week before, but Joel 2.12, this little book of Joel where God is proclaiming judgment on his people, but then he gives them hope. He says, tear your hearts, not just your clothes. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. God calls them to return to him in a real and a true way, not just outwardly, not just tearing their clothes, but beneath the surface, not just checking a box, not just walking an aisle, not even getting in the water to be baptized, but, but truly turning with their whole hearts, right? Peter puts it this way in the book of Acts. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Wow, don't we all need a season of refreshing? Don't we all need that? I've never been to a spa myself. Maybe some of you have. Um, it, it sounds relaxing. It sounds good, but I don't like people touching my face or any other part of me. Uh, I just don't like people touching me. So I wouldn't go to a spa, but, but maybe for you, that's the image that, that comes to your mind of a relaxing day at the spa, refreshing day. Well, well, Peter says, 
Jesus, if we would turn to him, if, if we would turn to God with our whole hearts, will give us a spiritual spa, will give us a day of refreshing, will fill our hearts with his love. And, and repent is one of those church words that, that we use a lot, that sometimes we forget what it means, but it basically just means we're walking this way. We're walking towards destruction. We're walking towards sin. We're walking in our hurts and our habits and our hangups. And then God calls us to turn the other direction and to start walking towards him. Start walking towards his son, Jesus, who died for us and rose again, right? And we need that. I, I know I do, and I, I know I did at the age of seven when I first gave my life to Jesus. He first made himself real to me. I know that I constantly need him over and over again for my life, to breathe into me, to refresh me, to call me back to a right relationship with him. Right? He saves us once and for all, but he also calls us to walk with him day after day after day. And when we do that for the first time, and, and when we continue to do that as believers, Ephesians 2 tells us this is the truth about what has happened. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. He brings us into his very presence. He makes us alive. He removes the things that used to separate us and makes us his children. That's who we are now. We, we are God's very children. And so he gives us the right relationship that we long for. He calls us to come back to him. And so the first thing getting from isolation to fellowship is, is stopping isolating ourselves from God. Stop isolating yourself from him and come into his right relationship. He invites us. He wants that for us. And he promises us that he will lift us up even now, not just in eternity in heaven, but right now his presence will be with us. But that's not the end of the story. He wants us to return to him, but he also wants us to reunite with God's people from all races, nationalities, and walks of life. In that very same chapter of Ephesians, after Paul tells us what happens vertically with, with God, he tells us what happens horizontally with our fellow man. It allows us to be reunited with the people of God, regardless of what your skin color is, regardless of where you came from, regardless of where you grew up, your socioeconomic status. Basically, whatever walk of life you come from, when you come to Christ, you have a family. He says, at that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. He's talking about us. He's talking about people who didn't grow up Jewish, who didn't grow up knowing the Old Testament, knowing those laws. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Paul says something very similar in Galatians 3, 27 through 28. He, he's writing to another church and he says, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since all are one in Christ Jesus. This is something that we might miss sometimes when we think about the good news. When we think about the gospel, we think about Jesus dying and rising again, and, and that's good. He did. Uh, he did die and he did rise again for our sins, for those things that we've done wrong. And when we come to him in repentance, when we turn from that sin and ask him to save us, he does save us individually. That, that's not something that your parents can do for you. That's not something that your community can do for you. That's something you have to do yourself. But it doesn't end there. It also leads us into right relationships with one another, right? We, we want to say me and Jesus sometimes, right? It's just me and Jesus, but Jesus didn't give us that option. When he makes us right with God, he brings us 
into a family. Becoming his means being adopted into his family. It means fellowshipping with that family. So we might not look the same. We might not sound the same. We might not have the same shared experiences, but we do have in common the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us from our sins, and that blood is thicker than water. So we return to God. We reunite with God's family. And then, thirdly, we remind ourselves that you're never alone. Remind yourself that you are never alone. Because you say, well, that that's all sounds really great, Pastor Justin, but what if we have to get locked down again? What if I can't be with the people that I want to be again? Well, no matter what happens, no matter how lo long lockdowns drag out, no matter how long quarantines continue to be a necessary evil for some of us, because of the promises of God, if we will turn to him in repentance, not just externally, not, not just on the outside, but on the inside, we will have his very presence and we'll have a family of people all across the world, all throughout the ages who are there for us, rooting us on, keeping us from the pitfalls of isolation. I want you to listen to these promises. The first one comes from Deuteronomy. It's from God the Father. The second one comes from God's Son, Jesus. It's the end of Matthew. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 says this, The Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Maybe you need that promise this morning. Maybe you're afraid or discouraged, and you need to be reminded that God doesn't leave you. He doesn't abandon you. Jesus says this at the end of the book of Matthew, one of his last words before he ascended into heaven. He says, and, I remem and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Don't let those words leave you as you walk through this life. Let them ring in your ears as you experience loneliness or even get depressed. Let them ring in your ears as you're tempted to slip back into that same old sin because no one's around you or, or when you don't know what to believe because there's so many different people saying so many different things and they all sound right and true. You're not sure. And maybe even your soul is being tortured day after day, but if you remember he is with you, if you remember that he wants to take you from isolation to fellowship, then you will never be alone. You'll see on your Connect card, if, if you want to get that out, uh, some next steps, some practical things that you can do based on what we've seen today in God's Word. Here at Emmanuel, we like to call them next steps, and we put them there so that you can actually check those boxes and, and say, yes, I want to do that. I want people to keep me accountable to do that. And so if you want to mark one of those on your Connect card, leave it in the basket as the lobby as you leave today. Someone will get in touch with you. The, the first one says this, I will turn from isolation to fellowship with God through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and, and you have been feeling so alone. You've been feeling so isolated. Maybe you're listening online and you still feel alone and isolated and, and you don't know what to do. And as I've been reading God's word and, and as we've been looking at the pitfalls of isolation and, and so much better God's plan and pathway forward to fellowship, you said, yes, that's what I've been looking for. That's what I wanted, but I didn't even know what it was or, or how to say it. I need to turn from my sin and, and return to God and, and have a new family from all over the world. If you've made that decision today that you've never made it before, mark that on your Connect card, or if you're online, mark it on your virtual connect card, put it in the basket, and, and one of our pastors, either me or Pastor Stan or Pastor Rick, will be in touch with you this week to let you know what to do next, what to do now that I've decided that I want to be in God's family. Maybe one of those things that you'll do is the next step. I will turn from isolation to fellowship with God's church through faithful attendance and joining a connection group, right? It, it's been a strange year, right? 
It's been difficult to know what to do. We've been um, out and in and and in and out. But let me encourage you to stay engaged and to stay motivated to be with God's people, both on Sundays and throughout the week, right? Right on Sundays, we come here and we worship God and we hear from his word and, and maybe we get to see each other in the parking lot or in the welcome center. And that's great. Um, But as we grow bigger as a church, we also need to grow smaller, meaning that we need to get into connection groups, get into smaller groups that we can talk to one another, that we can uh, say things that, that, you know, you couldn't say while I'm up here and talking the entire time, right? Because this isn't call and response, and and I would get all confused and lose my notes uh, if you started talking back to me. Uh, I would uh, not be able to go forward. But in small groups, you can. You can have that opportunity to respond and say, well, I heard this from that verse. What do you think? And you can also just come together and eat uh, and and enjoy one another's company. And and so if you check that box that that you want to be together with God's people, uh, someone will get in touch with you. If you're not already in a connection group uh, and tell you, here's some of the connection groups that we have here at Emmanuel. They're all different age groups for all different uh, interests, for all different sorts of people, right? You can encourage and be encouraged. And finally, uh, one more way to go from isolation to fellowship is something actually Pastor Rick talked about last week. Uh, You may have been here uh, when we talked about the ministry fair. We had the ministry fair, and, and I wanted to put it this way. I will turn from isolation to service by joining a ministry Team. In case you missed it last week, we had, what, 30 uh, ministries of Emmanuel Church, uh, and that wasn't all of them. Uh, some of them uh, couldn't have a table for whatever reason or another. And, and so there were all these ministries that, that were saying, hey, come serve with us. And of course, I'm going to tell you, come serve in the student ministry because it's awesome and because you get a bunch of middle schoolers who want to embarrass you and uh, make you feel like you don't understand the new lingo and you're old. Um, But I didn't sell it very well. But the student ministry is great. You should come uh, and and be part of the student ministry. But maybe that's not for you. Maybe you're, you know, crazy and and you don't want to go hang out with middle and high schoolers. Uh, But there are so many other opportunities to serve. And as you serve, you'll find that you develop friendships. You'll find that you develop uh, relationships with people that you might not have met in the parking lot outside. You might not have met in the Welcome Center after church. And so as you serve, you'll realize that, that you're not alone uh, and that there are others who love Jesus and who are coming alongside you. And, and so if you mark that spot on your Connect card, put it in the basket, uh, we are going to do our very best to help you find a place where you're gifted to serve in the church, <clears throat> student ministry, <clears throat> um, but or somewhere else, okay. Uh, but we will find a place for you. God has placed you here for a reason, and that reason is not to retreat further into isolation. It's not to intentionally strand yourself and, and grow your big beard and, and be a wild man away from society. No, he's called you to come out of isolation and back together with his So let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to be able to be in your presence this morning. We are grateful to even be here in such a confusing and difficult time in our lives, in our nation, in our communities. Lord, we love you and we love your people and we want to be together. We want to get out of isolation and back to fellowship. Lord, I pray for anyone here or listening online who today decided for the first time that they are going to get out of their spiritual isolation and reunite with the God who loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them. I pray that they would get in touch with us, that they would continue on the spiritual journey that they would continue to know you more and more and more as the days go on. I pray for those who are here and just feel isolated from each other, just feel like they haven't gotten to see one another for one reason or the other. 
I pray, Lord, that you would call them out of that isolation and back to fellowship with each other. And Lord, I pray that we would continue to serve you in ways that connect us, in ways that show us our purpose. Lord, may we want to be with you and may we want to be with one another and may we remember that we are not alone because you love us. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Justin. He just talked about fellowship. We need to sing about it. Let's stand up and sing about being brothers and sisters in Christ. Everybody needs someone beside them Shining like a lighthouse from the sea Brother, let me be your shelter Never leave you all alone I can be the one you call when you're low Brother, let me be your fortress When the night winds are driving on Be the one to light the way Bring your home Now there's a chain wrapped around my heart. I found a way to drop the keys from my failures, but now my hands can't reach that far. I ain't made for rivalry. I can never take this world alone. I know that in my weakness I am strong, but it's your love that brings me home. Brother, let me be your shelter. Never leave you home.
Amen, amen, amen. All right, you may be seated for just a moment. It is so good to have you here with us. And the sun has come out just in time for you to go and enjoy it, okay? But before you go, a couple things I want to remind you of, okay? First of all, uh, if you're a guest with us, we want you to know that we do take an offering, but we don't ask anything from our guests except for you to turn in that Connect card that Pastor Justin talked about, okay? So just turn that in. On the way out, there's a basket out there. Just drop that in. If you want to give, you give in the envelope. Uh, that'll help you re record your giving and just put this envelope also in the in the basket on the way out, but you can give online. All of that information is right on your screen if you're at home, or you can participate anywhere, anytime to give to Emmanuel Church, okay? So that's great. If you're a guest with us, and as I said earlier, we have those, we want you to have some free material. As soon as you leave the double doors, turn right. There's a table there uh, with some information of welcome to Emmanuel. Uh, we want you here. And we do, don't we? Amen. So uh, we have guests every week, amazingly so, and we want you to feel welcome, and you can participate in this, and there's even a new Bible there. If you're a new believer, you can pick up a Bible on the table, and then make your way down to the Welcome Center, and we have some good fresh coffee down there, and some coffee bars, and some cookies, and things like that, that you are welcome to participate in. We are just delighted that you're here. Pastor Rick has been away all week. He's been uh, preparing messages and ideas and truths for 2022. <laughs> Can you believe it? So, uh, uh, so he's been there and he's doing some things with his family and he'll be right back here on campus tomorrow. So uh, pray that God brings him back safely for us because we have missed him. It's so good to have you here, and I hope if you have any questions, I'll be in the back. Pastor Justin will be around, and then he do a great job. I mean, this youth guy is so good, and uh, we are just blessed beyond measure to have both of them with us, all three of them, three and a third with them, uh, with us, and uh, we're, we're grateful for that. It is so good to have you with us this morning. Uh, let's stand and just say what we really mean, uh, that we want to be together, but we also want to leap here and go be the church. You're dismissed. Thank you so much. Jesus.